Well, hello there. Tom here from The Run Testers with our monthly podcast. In this episode, we are going to be talking about ultras. So as well as Kieran, a man who quite likes to run long distances, we've also got a special guest, Hannah Tildesley, who works for Ultra X, and she's also half of Twice the Health. So they're going to be answering questions on all sorts of things to do with ultra running, like how to get involved, what you can expect from races, the sort of kit that you need to look at getting if you're planning on um, joining an ultra race at some point, and the sort of fueling you might need to do as well. If you're listening to the audio version of this, you'll also get an interview with Damien Hall, an ultra runner who you probably already heard of, but recently he won the Montaigne Winter Spine Race, which is a 268 mile race across the Pennines. Um, We didn't even know this at the point of doing the interview, so congratulations to Damien for that. So I hope you enjoy it. Let's dive into the podcast. Okay, so we're here with Kieran and uh, we have a guest on, Hannah Tilsley, who you may know from the world of ultra running. She works for Ultra X as, uh, what's your job title there, Hannah? I am community and partnerships manager, um, but being a small company, we uh, we tend to dip our toes into a bit of everything. Um, so I also look after the the content at races, um, and actually more most recently day to day as well. So a little bit of uh, communications across the board, I guess. Brilliant. Well, we've got we've got you in today to talk about ultra running, and this is something that I don't really know a great deal about. I've done a couple of sort of fifty k ones, but. Um, not particularly well. Um, so obviously we've, we've we've got we've got Kieran who uh, likes a little bit of long distance running, as we've, we we know from uh, various events he's done, and we'll we'll dip into those in, in a bit. But really, we're gonna we're gonna just have a a chat about the world of ultra running, what it is, what people can expect from it, and as with the run testers, we'll be talking a little bit about the sort of kit that people should be wearing when they they look at doing ultras. Sounds good. Sounds great. Excellent. We're going to convince you to do an ultra by the end of this, Tom. That's that's the that's our plan. By the end of it, you'll be ready. People are always trying to convince me to do ultras, and I just can't be bothered with it. I actually have a pretty good track record of convincing people to do these things. Like it's almost like an ongoing joke between me and my friends, friends who have absolutely said. And to be fair, I was one of them. I remember when a friend asked me to do Jordan, I was like, absolutely not. Why would anyone do that? That sounds like the worst thing I could possibly put myself through. And here we are. So, um, well. I thought you- You've, you've got about 30, 40 minutes to try and convince me, and, and this is going to be on the record. So if, if it works, then you get full credit for it. But um, yeah, let's see see how, if you can make those skills last on a man who's probably spent 10 years avoiding doing this. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's going to be, it's going to put it to the test. Uh, all right, let's just, let's jump straight into the questions. So um, I suppose the main one is, and this is, there's probably people listening to this podcast that don't really know a lot about ultra running, and it is of quite a confusing concept to, to get a, a hold of um i remember when i started looking into ultra running um quite a lot of websites say that ultra running is basically any distance running over uh, 26.2 miles so if you go over a marathon you're basically ultra running but there's probably a little bit more to it than that and i, I think most people would probably have different views on what exactly ultra running is so hannah what what in how would you see or how would you explain ultra running to somebody who didn't know anything about it um, well, I think first things first is is obviously the distance is, is technically anything over a marathon, and I think people get really hung up, especially in the kind of current uh, current way of the world, and, and as the sport grows, that it needs to be like you know some crazy two hundred kilometer plus distance, and, and obviously that's not true. I know you kind of did it at the beginning. Ultra running really is anything over a marathon, and uh, in my slightly biased opinion, it's it's far more enjoyable than a marathon because there's a lot less pressure on kind of time and uh, splits it's more about where you've been what you've seen maybe maybe a little bit on how high you've climbed but how about you Kieran you probably you've done a, you've done a fair bit of ultra running in your time how, how would you explain it to somebody who didn't have a clue what it was yeah I mean some people might kind of say that the sort of 50k mark is it's kind of almost like a lower benchmark really for what you call ultra ultra races but Listen, I think anything that extends you over and beyond the, the marathon distance, and it can be in race conditions, it can be on your own. I think it, essentially what ultra running does is sort of open up this world of of running as kind of exploration and adventure and uh, a slightly you know, slower and easier challenge if you're not kind of racing up the top with the elites. 
and you know some people sort of have described it as you know it's a long walk with snacks but you know so you're you're mixing up running with walking and hiking you're probably going to places that you know you don't you wouldn't normally reach if you're doing kind of urban runs really and places that other people can't get to or you can only get to on foot so to me it's very much ultra running that mindset really is about the exploration and adventure and like Hannah said sort of seeing new things and it being an experience and a longer journey than necessarily chasing a, a city marathon. Um, so it's not, is it, is it just long trail running? I mean, technically I it's would say, trail. I mean, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. True. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the thing there's, it can be, you know, there's plenty, there are, there's, you know, I think when I first went, made the journey from marathon to ultra, I set out to try and do what I was like five or six different types of ultra that I thought there were. So, you know, one was a, a trail ultra in the UK on, on the coast. One was a mountain ultra, the 100K, the 50K, and then the 100 mile. But there's the, you know, there's 24-hour track races. There's the Comrades Marathon, which is all road. So there's there's this whole variety of ultra. There's now you know, 200 mile races. There's the multi-stage ultra, like the MDS or the Ultra X races, where you're, you know, you're running longer distances, but over a, a period of sort of five or six days. So there's a variety, but many, many, I think of them sort of tend to go to the trails or to places where yeah. I guess there's, it's nicer things to look at. But. I think that's the beauty of it in some respects is that there is no kind of, um, it's why there's such a variety of very, very good ultra marathon runners, because the best mountain runner in the world won't be the fastest comrades time, you know, that they take such different kind of skills and um, abilities to conquer different kind of, disciplines of the ultra marathon and i think that's what makes it such a cool sport is that there really is something for everyone even from like uh kind of external conditions like the weather or whatever if if you go to the desert you're very good at you know (laughs) keeping yourself cool then then perhaps you're gonna you're gonna um prosper in that in that area of ultra marathon running but if not then maybe something i don't know there's obviously ones in the antarctic or at the, the complete other end of the spectrum there is actually as, as Kieran said, so many different types of ultramarathons and therefore really no reason for people not to try it. Okay, so let's delve into how. what's the best way to get started. If, if, if you're listening to this and you're thinking, oh, I wouldn't mind giving ultra running a go, is there is there a good entry point for ultra running? Is it, uh, it, would you, Should you just sign up for a, a big race or is, is there a way to get into it that is e- easily accessible for people who maybe haven't done anywhere near the distance before? So I think the first thing and the most difficult thing is always the actually saying yes to it. Uh, I haven't been doing the very long at all and I'm definitely not an expert in, uh, in this running world. But um, I remember my, some of my best experiences are things that, First up, I said absolutely no to because I was scared that I couldn't do it or I thought it was too hard for me or, or you know, it was out of my comfort zone, whatever. The, the easiest thing to do is at first, if it's like, if you see even just slightly kind of tickled your fancy or you've taken a slight interest into it, just say yes, because actually that's the most difficult part. The rest of it is obviously has its highs and lows, but but that's the easiest part. I think also don't, don't be afraid to go into something that scares you. I think but so often people say, don't jump in the deep end. I think sometimes in ultra marathon running, you kind of have to, because if you're going into ultra marathon running, the likelihood is you're already jumping in the deep end, because whether it's 43.2 kilometers or 200 kilometers, it's a very, very long way. Um, and I guess the once you've kind of said the yes or, or, or thought about it, um, the big thing for me is I think see it as an experience. So st- don't just sign up to it because it's 100 miles. Sign up to it because... It's somewhere you want to see that's a cool part of the world or some friends are doing it or there's a cool community around it. Like make it make it more than just a race. And I think that also makes it a lot easier to kind of commit to that first one and also make the experience a lot more enjoyable rather than it seem seem very daunting and something that actually you just fear for the four months you train for it. Kira, you any thoughts on uh, easy entry points for people, newbies that want to start? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's there's a really great book by uh, Stephen Magnus, I think, and it, it's called Do Hard Things. And one of the things that he, I've seen him kind of mention quite a lot is about the, it's, like, it's really important to have the goals that are, they're not too difficult, they don't stretch you too far, because if it's too intimidating and too far, it can be uh, quite kind of paralyzing and they need to be achievable, but difficult, you know, so, and I think that's really, there's a great way of sort of doing that with ultra. The, my very first ultra was actually, there used to be a thing called the Royal Parks Ultra. So it was an extension of the half marathon. You actually started 
at the start with the half marathon runners. You'd run through London. At one point, you would turn right over a bridge and then head back west in London. And all the half marathoners would just go the other way. And then you did, I think it was 30 miles. So it was like a 50K. And, you know, up to that point, I'd, I'd run marathons before that. But those extra five miles, although they were definitely enormously daunting and I had no idea what it would be like going that little bit further and it felt like a huge step. Actually, now I look back, it was a nice little jump up and I it was on road or on flat by the river, you know, a little bit of river path. So it wasn't too crazy in terms of, you know, technical running and mountain running. And I think that's that's a nice thing to do is to go, you know, just take a little bite. And I think that's that's really how I would sort of suggest in, in anyone's kind of running sort of growth, you sort of go from you know couch to 5K, 5K to 10K, 10K to the half, and you're taking off these little bites. Um, and I think that can be a great way to do it. I also, you know, with what Hannah said, sometimes if you really need to get the focus in, you want to go and do something that's maybe a little bit, it's going to scare you into action. You know, you've got to be, make sure that you're well prepared and that you, you take something that is motivating and inspiring. But mm-hmm. I think there's, there's definitely something to be said to be sort of taking, taking those kind of little steps. And, you know, there are plenty of, of races out there that enable you to go up in small steps rather than going straight to your first hundred miler. Yeah, and I, I suppose there's a lot of ultra running events as well where when it's when it's road distance, there's a very big focus on time. So mm-hmm. people get fixated about the time they're going to do their marathon, and even if it's their first one. But with with ultra running events, it's a little bit different, isn't it? You you can walk, and you it's more more about finishing and the experience than than just trying to hit that that time that for some reason everyone seems to want to hit. Yeah, but there are some great races as well. You know, you can you'll be able to find these. I mean, we could suggest them, but you know, the threshold series races that they are full of people who are doing this for the first time. Really. There's a lot of people doing it for the first time. They've got lots of aid stations to help. There's lots of support. There's lots of people who are in the same boat, you know, so there's a great spirit. I mean, on ultra, there's always that great spirit of people helping you along. Everybody wants everyone else to finish, you know, um, but some of them are a little bit more uh, open to, or, or there's a, there's a few more people who might be having this experience for the first time. There's something really, you know, helpful and, and, and good about having, you know, being in that kind of crowd as well. Yeah. I okay. Agree. So you talked a bit about, yeah, you mm-hmm. talked a bit about events there. Um, sorry, sorry, Hannah, you can say something. No, I was just going to say I did Threshold as one of my first, my first, as my first 100 kilometer and it would like, you know, hit the nail on the head. It was so welcoming. I spoke to so many people who were also doing their first ultra marathon at the start line and out on the course. And there's something very comforting about that. And, you know, you're always bound to find, um, find people who are doing it for the for the first time I'm sure but I think Threshold definitely facilitate a, a very kind of welcoming environment for that um, and they also do allow you to do the just the one day or do it over two days or do it in one day so there's that opportunity to kind of jump up as you as you progress get more confident. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I've actually done uh, a couple of the Threshold series ones well the same one twice um, Race of the Stones but I, I only managed to get a 50k well I did it at Kieran but I twisted my ankle so I had to stop at 50k <laughs> Um, but I, I think the thing about the threshold series, which is good, is it it means that you can focus on the distance and not anything else because you don't have to worry about food, you don't have to worry about where you're staying and all those sorts of things. It's just you've you've always got enough food and water along the way. Whereas a lot of events that you do, and I, I'm sure you've both done events like these, where you'd have to take your own pack and you have to be in charge of your, your own your, your own kit as you're going along. There, there's a lot more pressure on, on not just the run itself and the distance, but also on just everything staying alive from yeah, yeah. from from the elements as well um so with that in mind what do you both think makes for a good ultra event i think the first one for me would be the place um mm. i think one of the the best things about ultra marathon running is obviously that you, you run a relatively long way which means you get to see um a lot more of a, a place than you perhaps would if you were just going on holiday or if you were hiking even. Um, I know slightly different with cycling, but I don't cycle. So <laughs> um, we're going to stick to being able to run a long way and explore. And um, Emily and I, who's um, my kind of business partner, when we first sort of delved into the long distance running stuff, we used to do like self-supported 50 kilometer runs run hikes um and we chose incredible parts of the world to do them in so we did our first one in the grand canyon and then we did the great wall of china and then we did the great ocean road and it was so empowering one you know being self-supported obviously we had we knew people that were out there but but kind of um being out there by ourselves and being able to like soak in soak up this incredible kind of landscape or environment that we were in obviously it varied depending on where we were and so i think when it came to choosing 
sort of my first race that I went with the desert, which obviously was again, like a really, really cool part of the world and perhaps a corner of the earth I never would have visited if I wasn't doing an ultra marathon. So I think that's definitely a big one f- for me. And I think probably the go-to for most people, um, obviously based on accessibility and all of those things. The second one, and perhaps this takes knowing the industry a little bit better or having friends that do, that do these events is definitely the community and the support. Um, yes, of course, there's some value, I'm sure, once you get more experienced in going to those races that you do have to kind of completely kind of fend for yourself. And um, and it's a lot, a lot riskier in terms of external factors. But actually, especially when you're doing your first race, I think knowing there's going to be well-supported checkpoints, knowing there's going to be lots of people out on course, knowing you're never that far away from someone, should you need some help or support or whatever, um, is actually really, really valuable. And I definitely took that for granted when I was doing my first kind of races. I just assumed that every race was like this. And actually, as Kieran said, the threshold events are incredibly well-supported, as are you know as are the Ultra X events. It's kind of the same thing. Um, and I think there's definitely a lot of value in that and a lot of um, reassurance in that if you're doing your first one. Okay, uh, all good advice, Karen. Have you got any uh, like suggestions for first ultra events that you would suggest are a good good um, fit for people who are just looking to like? Apart from the threshold series, which kind of covered those. Yeah, I mean we've we've mentioned threshold. I I think you you want to look. I mean, there's there's so many races out there, and I the another set of races that um, a side of the threshold series that I look at is the Centurion series. Mm. These are a little bit more. I, th- I guess they're a little bit more serious isn't the right word, but they're a little bit more challenging perhaps. They're not quite so geared to the first timers, but they are brilliantly well marshaled and they do uh, a range of races that are from, they do 50 milers and a hundred milers and the 50 milers in different locations, the South Downs and the North Downs in the UK, brilliantly accessible. And again, I, I just think the spirit of the people who, who uh, are on the aid stations and look after those races. They know ultra running inside out. They know how to look after you. They can see when you might be struggling and what you need. They know when to say, come on, tough it out or, you know, have a seat. So mm. one of my experiences in one of those races, the last aid station, there are some chairs and I, you know, I've been running for 23 hours. And as I arrived, this guy could, he could see, he sensed because he's been standing there all day seeing people that if I sat in that chair, I wasn't going anywhere for hours, so he took the chair away. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's a bit. It's a bit extreme, but you know, they. What well, I mean, they just they kind of get ultra running really well, mm-hmm. and I think that's that's somewhere to look. I also, I mean, I, I think we'll talk about ultra X probably, but if you want something that's going to take you a bit further afield, and I completely agree with Hannah here, I think you need to find something that's going to grab you, you know, by the gut and make you, you know, really inspired to go and run it. That really helps. So often the races that I've picked, I've just seen a picture of someone doing it, and it's just caught my imagination. And I've invested in it as a result. That's been great. And the only other thing I'd say is if you can find somewhere for those early ultras that if you've got a very supportive family, I loved being in places where I could bring my family along for the experience and they might either be on the course or or nearby at the end and you know, friends and family can come and support you. And that is a huge, huge help outside of anything else that I ever take in my kit. If I can have a few people there to encourage me along the so, way. So, I think so choose a where thing. that they want to go to. Yeah, good holiday. Not just not so they might want to go on holiday, yeah. Or, <laughs> or just that's accessible accessible. And here, here's another sort of quick tip on that. Some of the when you're thinking about your first ultra, one thing that you it's easy to forget is that you often finish a long way from where you start, right? And you somehow you've got to get back. So having friends and family there at the end to spool you into a car is dead handy. Okay, cool. Well let's let's dive into training. Now tra- training something that I'll, I'll pose it from my, my perspective. I run a lot of half marathons, a lot of marathons. I can't get my head around the training for ultra marathons. I've got a friend who keeps trying to get me to do do them as well, and he seems to be doing a lot of of mileage. Is it really just the case of if you're doing an ultra marathon, you just need to train a lot more, or it, have I got it wrong? Because that's that's one of the main things that's dissuading me from doing an ultra marathon. Um, I wouldn't. I mean, obviously, if you're running further, the, the natural kind of uh, assumption is that you is that you need to be putting in more miles I think there's definitely I'm not going to pretend that it's not time consuming and it's not a lot of miles but there is definitely a way that you can train a bit smarter um, I can't say I follow it but I, th- I think that there definitely is if if you didn't have the time or the lifestyle that allowed for lots of miles there's definitely a way of training in a in a smarter manner that allows you to kind of obviously get uh, time on your feet um, and get in the key sessions, but doesn't mean you have to be running 10 to 12 hours a week. Um, I think the thing I would say is whilst it, in a lot of cases, it does kind of equate to more miles being run. 
I hadn't trained for like a fast marathon ever. And I tried to do it last year. And I was running less miles, but I had a lot more kind of, I guess, key sessions or faster sessions or tempo sessions or whatever, which meant that my social side of my training so when I just rang friends and was like hey I've got 20 miles who wants to come and join and someone might join for a few miles and it didn't matter what pace we were running at or whether we stopped for coffee six times or whatever it was just about getting the miles in having time on my feet often my my training was put in hours so if I was out for three hours it didn't matter if I'd walked or ran really as long as I was kind of putting in that time on my feet I lost a lot of that with marathon training because instead of having three hours on a Sunday I'd have 10k at 4.15s, 10k at 4, you know, whatever it might be. So actually, there wasn't that many people that really wanted to come and do that with me because it wasn't very nice. Um, whereas with ultramarathon training, yes, maybe the hours are more and the miles are more, but I feel like it can be a lot more social. And also, you can do it anywhere. You don't need to run around Battersea Park in circles. You can drive out of London or drive away from where you live. And actually, it's a really cool opportunity to explore. So whilst at first, I know it seems daunting and it seems like more time and more miles, I think you can kind of flip it on its head and look at it in a way that has a lot of pros to that rather than cons necessarily. Good answer that. You're converting me. <laughs> you're, se- you're selling it to me. Thank you. Uh, Kieran, I know, I know you're a man who likes a, a contemplative long run of a weekend. I suppose that's a nice bonus for you. Yeah, I mean, I, that's the way I think this, it's, this is sort of going through the ultra thing. I think it sort of flips the mentality a little bit and you sort of you start to want to keep the pace down and be and enjoy being out for as long as you can. I mean, I, I will often just now go out and escape into the new forest and it's a, a great Sunday afternoon is if I've got a bit of food in a backpack and I can go and disappear for four hours and not see anyone. And I don't always, I mean, I'm not running that whole four hours. I'm running a bit very low and slow. I'll stop, sit on the log, eat some food and go again and, you know, and just, just enjoy moving at a slower pace and trying to get my head up and enjoy the surroundings. And I think that changes the way that you think about running and training. And I know that it, it can be very easy to think about those kind of, but we're thinking about running hard and fast. And I think a lot of people do that in their marathon training anyway. And perhaps, you know, there's a good argument to do a, a lot of kind of lower and slower training and ultra kind of speaks to that. But I, I think as well as the sort of physical side and getting that fitness, one of the big things that you've got to do obviously is train your mind. And that's where much of it comes in, I think. And those long days on feet, whether you're running or walking, or hiking or whatever, you know, your ability to kind of push through and go when you feel like you don't really want to, that's that's crucial the other thing i i guess is you know there's always this kind of strength training stuff so that you're making sure that your your running form and how you're running and you've got the best kind of foundation to do all of those miles off without getting injured and that can really help runners hate doing strength training mostly but it completely changed my own ultra running ability by spending a lot of time in the gym and in fact when i trained for the marathon de saab I did quite low mileage. I think the furthest that I ran ahead of that race was probably a 17 or 18 miler. Mm. I saw lots of people going out and they were doing back-to-back marathons and they were spending a long time on feet right up to the race. And I didn't. I did low mileage. I did quite low intensity. I did an awful lot of time in the gym doing weighted squats and lifting. And I actually went into that multi-day ultra undercooked, unfit, essentially, or less than fit. And then throughout the week, my coach said to me, don't worry, don't panic. So I was watching all these other people running loads of miles. I was thinking, am I getting this right? I put a lot of trust in. He said, don't worry, you're going to get stronger as the race goes on. Everyone else who's done all of that really massive volume mileage in the build-up too close are going to get tired during the week. And he was absolutely right. I, I finished that race running the marathon day stronger than I started and and loved it. And I, I think there's there's something about kind of, you know, not just thinking about the running as well, the final thing I'd, on that I think is just food and nutrition, which I think we're going to come on to. But you have it's different, and you have to train yourself to be able to consume calories and get your hydration right. It's, it becomes more important as you go further. Okay, that's another area that I can't be bothered with. Um, <laughs> eating, but, well, I love eating. Scott, but you <laughs> strategic eating. I, I like eating, but I don't like doing it strategically and carrying it around with me. Um, oh, what- yeah, when I say that though, I mean when I say strategically, I mean you start when you do this, you'll go from marathons to ultras. You probably start out still thinking about gels and you know and, and, and hydration tablets, and as you get a bit more experience, you start eating pork pies and sausage rolls and whatever well, we, it is. I think we available. we all saw your meal updates when you were in the Danube, uh, schnitzels and cakes every day and stuff. That did look pretty yeah. good actually. I was quite jealous. I was going to say I was, anything- I was doing it anyway. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say if anything, it's, it's, um, it's less strategic. I think it's. Uh, I am very bad at, at, and part of the reason I failed running a fast marathon is um because I just am rubbish at the like 
gel every 10k or whatever you're supposed to do however many carbs you're supposed to have an hour I'm, I'm terrible at that stuff but I am very good at eating and I'm very good at eating like the foods I really like like sandwiches and pasta and you know crisps and cheese and all of these things and because you're moving at a slightly slower pace and because you're not so worried about I mean obviously you're worried a little bit about what, what you're carrying but nowhere near as much as you are when you're running a fast road marathon um I'm, I'm better at it I, if anything because I just eat whenever I want and you're walking so it's, it's just a walking picnic and I think that's that makes yeah, it I've slightly got, got to be honest that ever, ever since I uh, read Dean Carnassus the first book when he talks about running and eating pizza on the way and people delivering a pizza during the during your training sessions I, I did, it did tempt me with that <laughs> yeah um, it's de- definitely so it seems like one of the high points of ultra running yeah for sure. um, my one of my favorite things, I went to the UTMB as a journalist and was able to watch the runners come into the Cormier aid station, which is about halfway around. And they've been running for, I don't know, six hours or so as the elites. And they lay out all their tables and their crew put down the foods that they're going to eat and they bring them in. And it's like a, you know, like an F1 pit stop. And my favorite table was one runner. Some people came in, they had like Ritz crackers and they had this kind of all sorts of lovely looking food and different selections. One guy came out and he just had one quarter of this massive picnic bench. And he just had some sushi rolls on it. And the runner came in and had sushi rolls. I was thinking, I don't know how that seems out there to me. But when you actually think back to it, it's like, it's basically just good white rice, which burns fast. It's good fast burning carbs, a bit of salt in the seaweed. Mm -hmm. And it's absolutely bang on. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it just shows you, like, when you get to a certain level, I reckon, you know, you can, as long as it works for you, whatever. Okay, so let's let's carry on with the... Um, the fueling then Hannah, Hannah when you're doing what, what sort of distance do you do what's your biggest distance that you've done for a, an ultra event um, in one go it was Race to the Stones I did 100k but in a week 250 in five days sorry. so what so so I, I, I probably I imagine that your 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 uh, fueling for Race to the Stones was basically eat all the nice food that they've got at all the stops I, I think I actually finished the 50k Race to the Stones having consumed far more calories than I burnt <laughs> off during during the race. So um, good. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was uh, yeah, a lot of stuff that I would never buy like, like massive packs of jaff cakes and stuff. Yeah. Um but 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 for your multi-day one, how do you what is your fueling strategy for a multi-day race like that? Um yeah, I mean I think first first and foremost I want to say it's it's definitely like a try and test it thing. I um touch wood have a, a pretty good stomach and can eat and run relatively easily and, and can eat almost anything. But I'd say the biggest lesson for me um, in terms of fueling these types of races, especially multi-stage races where you kind of pack what you're going to eat for the week and then you can't buy anything else. Like, for example, when we're in the desert, you obviously couldn't just nip to the shops and pick up a few bits. I know that's not the same with every race, but let's assume that you're packing what you, you, you are going to eat for the whole week and you're not going to be able to go to a shop and get anything else. I packed, and I have a very sweet tooth, but I packed purely sweet stuff you know flapjacks even like protein shakes and stuff were sweet I was having porridge in the morning that was sweet like everything I was eating apart from the dehydrated meals was sweet and it became very dull very quickly and and quite sickly and I remember actually Susie Chan who I'm sure everyone knows um had said to me pack blocks of parmesan and I was like don't be so ridiculous I'm not gonna eat that when I'm running and I was like just desperate for that parmesan by the time by by it came to like day two I, I was so sick of I'll never eat and I love them, so it's very sad, but I'll never eat a cheer charge flatjack again because I ate so many of them <laughs> on that desert ultra marathon run and they're delicious and I love them. But I literally just stuffed myself a little silly with them and by the end of the week couldn't face it. And the same as porridge. I just probably won't ever eat porridge again. Um, but so I think that's definitely one thing is pack a variety of foods that so that no matter how you know, you obviously lose your appetite in these races, you get to a point where you don't want to eat anything and you you, you have no idea what you're going to want or what you want to what you're going to crave. So I think pack lots of flavors um, and just be a little bit smart on that. We actually had um, so with a lot of these races, you have you have to carry uh, a certain amount of calories extra. So if anything happens to you, you um, you have something with you. And during our ultra marathon world championship event in June, um, the guy who actually won, so you can't knock it. Who uh, I'm going to stay within a few weeks. Um, yet carry 800 calories of spare food and so for a, a weight kind of to gain on the weight side of things he uh just packed 800 grams of, of goose fat 
because mm. it hit the calories but obviously in terms of size yeah. it was very very small so i'm not saying go that extreme in your variety but um but definitely maybe pack some stuff yeah. you don't did think you'll need did he just did he actually you need it in little gel it. packs don't you yeah well he didn't have to eat it because he didn't get into an emergency situation um right okay but, all right see so, yeah so yeah it was back up it's back up i get you yeah, yeah, yeah. if he yeah, had right. um he he would have <laughs> he would have suffered slightly the thing i also learned and again from one experience but um what the guy I met when I was running, he carried um, caffeine bullets, which I'd never heard of and never used. Um, I drink a lot of coffee. I'm fine with caffeine, but I just never heard of them or used them at that time. And I remember they were absolute godsend because they were minty. And it's the same as the like Bella Forte. They do like a chew that's lemon and mint. Um, mm. Something like that is so useful because you get to a point where your mouth is horrible because all you've eaten is sweet gels, you know, like um, – fake food basically in some cases and your mouth starts to taste so disgusting and actually the previously the the caffeine bullets the mint ones were a treat and then now i use the Forte blocks a little bit more but having something that kind of refreshes the palate is definitely yeah definitely good i think kieran you know a bit, bit about fueling don't you well we talked about your schnitzel obsession <laughs> but uh you're, you're quite keen on on actual fueling gels and stuff aren't you when you're doing ultras yeah, I mean, I I like to, I, I guess I sort of took a, when I've done these things, I like to take kind of foundation of what I know is going to be a really good sort of solid nutritional base. So it ticks all the boxes in terms of vitamins and minerals and what you need and have that often as a, in a shake or as my kind of morning uh, starting point. I, I quite like with multi-day ultras as well to, or even on normal ultras, but I have like a liquid breakfast because it's easier to have to worry about opening up a stove and lighting a fire and cooking something and heating. So I just had liquid breakfast at the MDS and, like yeah, and I, I, if I, if it wasn't, it wasn't alcohol. No, not that kind. Not the airport <laughs> time. time Tom, no. but, yeah, but just it's a mix of kind of, um, it's actually 33 fuel. They do a shake, an elite kind of um, fueling shake and some super greens. Um, so I took some, some fish oil stuff and bits and pieces to start the body as well. But I, you know, one thing I think that aside from that and that kind of race fueling bit, when you, if you're doing these and you're getting back and you've got time to eat and you're going to go again on a multi-stage, one other thing I found really useful was I compartmentalized my food. So I took lots of small bits of different food. So I had, mm -hmm. you know, it's when you're talk, thinking about the weight, I'd weighed out, you know, one nut of each different type, which took up 25 grams. And I had those for seven days. And I had a few crisps that were vacuum sealed and I had different bits. And it had that effect of a bit like an airplane meal. When you get back to the campsite and you've, you're sort of killing time, you're sort of going through these sort of different snacky bits. But it also had the feeling that you were having different tastes and different flavors and it was a bit more of an experience rather than just having one thing that's all the same and lots of it. So I would think about that. Give yourself different experiences because it's motivationally, I think that's really strong. And particularly with your kind of your camp or post race food as well. I think that goes for the same. If you've got them in your, in your pack, you've got a different selection. You never know, you know, even on some races, you can have a day where some of the fueling products that you, your go to day in, day out for some reason on that day, they don't go down right or you've had enough of them after a certain point. You, it helps to have somewhere else to go with some other food in your pack as an alternative. Um, things I really like as well, I go all kind of proper food like dates, nuts, those kind of things. They're, they're really good. Um, ap dried apricots, dried fruit, those kind of things I think really help rather than always look into kind of super sticky gels and the, the more artificial stuff. I also think it just makes you hey. feel better, like especially with the multi-stage stuff. Um, often your proper meal is, is a dehydrated meal, um, which some of them actually are relatively good nutritionally. Um, but you do start to get to a point where you feel like, or I certainly did, where I felt like I'd just eaten a lot of beige. And actually, if you can have some kind of fruit or some nuts or something that you put in your body and you know is actually good for you, uh, even if it's kind of a very small, small thing and a bit of a placebo effect even, uh, it does make you feel a lot better and feel better in yourself, I think, as, you, as you're running or even just mm -hmm. wake you up. Mm -hmm. Well, my final my final tip, Tom, is this. If you're going to somewhere hot, which sometimes if you're going to go do these multi-stage, they often are chocolate, a lot of sweets, and a lot of things with chocolate, or they'll melt. <laughs> they melt. And you I'm not going to bother then. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> chocolate digestives, you, you can't be taking those. You know, there's lots of things that, yeah, you'll... They sound great when you get them out, then you open them up, it's a disaster. So that's a mistake to avoid. And lots of things you don't think will melt do. Like even like I've, I've had flapjacks that yeah. just fall apart because they're like oil. <laughs> By the time you take them out of your pocket, it's just mush. All right. Well, we've talked about food and fueling. Um, if you want to find out about the different types of gels and things that are, are available and, and also about how Kieran fueled his uh, Danube uh, run, 
I have a, how many days was it, Kieran? I did 60, 67 67 days. marathons, 67 days. So yeah, he there's a there's a lot of videos on the channel that, that Kieran's covered about uh, various fueling and eating strategies that he's got. Um, but let's let's talk about the big one. Let's talk about kit. Uh, let's keep it simple to start off with. How important is kit for running ultra marathons? It's pretty important. Yeah, um, it, it can definitely make or break a race. I think, and and it's one of the few things you can control. I think as well is a big thing. Um, you've you've got the opportunity, assuming you haven't entered the ultra mar- an ultra marathon that's tomorrow. You've got the opportunity to try and test these things, and and of course things can go wrong on the day. You can get blisters in shoes you've never got blisters in before. It can all happen, but it is one of the few things you can more or less control. And so I think definitely getting it right. You know, stuff that doesn't chafe, shoes that don't rub, kit that you feel good in, kit that you feel com- comfortable in, um, I think also plays a big part in it. So, yeah, pretty high in my, my books. Yeah, I'd agree. I mean, getting, you, you getting have to say it, right. Kieran. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, no, don't buy anything. Yeah, don't, you don't need anything. Don't. No, I, I mean, I, the thing is, I think there's, there's two sort of sides to this. And I think Hannah's right. It's like you, you feel like you can control it. I think it's really quite an important process to go through whilst you're training as well, because there's lots of, there's probably lots of kind of, fear or just like intimidation about what's going to happen to you on the ultra and having that feeling that you're affecting something in the build-up is quite a good sort of psychological boost that you've got these things that you can control and you get comfortable in your kit and you know it very well you know things like with the pack silly like testing where the bottles sit and how they're going to run and you know knowing exactly where all your bits and bobs are going to be and how accessible they are there's so many different things that you need to try out and each time you get this right and you learn something and it works it builds a bit of confidence in your ability to to go out and and do this and particularly with those sort of longer multi-stage that that's a really big thing the one thing i'll say though you can get really i'm going to sort of contradict myself a little bit because it's really good to pay a lot of attention to detail on the kit and you have to you know making sure everything works right for you at the same time things are definitely going to go wrong and if you get to the point where you can't be adaptable when something breaks or something goes wrong and you love that bit of kit so much that it psychologically puts you in, in a hole that's a bad thing so a good example on the danube i spent ages and ages choosing the bottles that i was going to take my and i took two hard flasks um from camelback that are nicely kind of ergonomic they sort of sit across the chest really nicely and i was all chuffed to bits that i found these special <laughs> bottles and they were going to be my water for the for the whole time 650 mils on day six i took off my pack to put a jacket on in the rain on the side of the road in bulgaria ran on and then about six miles down, looked down to pick up my water bottle and one of them was gone. And in that moment, it was at the end of a long, long day. I was like, that's it. It's done. The, this Danube run is finished. I'm coming home. Like, how can I run without my bottles? You know, the ones that I liked. And and you the, you can get into kind of a negative mindset if you rely too much. What I actually did was just buy a plastic bottle the next day. I carried that one and it actually ended up working better than the other soft, the other hard flask that I had anyway. So, but there's, there's, there's going to be little moments where, you know, your battery might die on something or, you know, a pair of socks might get a hole or something, but you have to not be so intent on that bit of kit being your magic kind of talisman that uh, becomes psychologically negative. You have to be able to move on and adapt and stick on any old pair of socks if you need to. I also think on that, okay. like, don't... It's very easy to see someone wearing, and this is perhaps slightly hypocritical for me and what, what I do, but it's very easy to see someone wearing a piece of kit and assume that that is the only option and the best one for you, when actually it would be so nice if that was the case and like someone could just write a list of like the top five pieces of kit that you needed for any ultra marathon unfortunately that's not the case it really is similar to the food it is a case of just trying things testing them um and sometimes it's not the most expensive pair of shoes or the most expensive pair of shorts or the jazziest pair it it can be quite a you know a bog standard pair or whatever it's just whatever your body is comfortable in and your body fits you know fits you or whatever so i think don't get too hung up on what people are telling you to wear definitely try and test all of those things but go with the one that actually works best for you not the one that i've done it so many times you know i want the pair of trainers that's white i don't want the pair of trainers that's pink and blue and purple i want to look cool and snazzy <laughs> but actually fundamentally they're probably not the best ones for me yes we've all been there yeah. um so, um all right so i'm gonna make it difficult for you now we're not going to delve into all of the kit that you you guys use for your ultra runs because we could be here all day but I want. Can, can you pick one thing out that you really rate and you you couldn't do an ultra without? Give, give me your top pick, uh, Hannah. Oh, good question. If you can pick something. Um. So I won't get specific with the brand because I actually have a few pairs that I wear that are different brands. Um, but one 
kind of shift I made, I guess, when I stepped up into the slightly longer stuff is, and I run in shorts a lot, and I know obviously it's not always the case, but um, I, I get quite hot running anyway. Um, but I see a lot of ultra runners in like super short, baggy shorts. For me, it doesn't work at all. Um, I tend to run in the like, I think they're like eight inch um, longer shorts. I have some underarm ones, I have some Lululemon ones, but they both also have pockets in the side of them. So obviously you can have stuff in your pack, but also you can have stuff in your side pockets, which is really good. For, for a number of things the first being I don't know if you, if you want to take photos and stuff obviously you can have your phone in there or GoPro or whatever but also having really easily accessible food like the stuff that you're eating at that time if you're working your way through a pack of biscuits or whatever it is you're eating um having having that those in that, those really accessible pockets is really good and obviously shoving rubbish in those as well so you're not littering the trails so that's definitely something that I would always something that I would always wear when I'm running longer distances slightly longer shorts that then mean I don't chafe but also have the nice pockets inside so I can get stuff in and get stuff out very easily. Yeah, I think you're among friends uh, talking about pockets. We spend a lot of time talking about pockets on a running kit. Uh, yeah. And if it hasn't got pockets, we're normally quite upset with it. So I imagine <laughs> ultra, it's uh, significantly more important. Uh, are you going to talk about pockets as well, Kieran? I'm going to give an honourable mention to the Seamount Max Storage Shorts, the mm-hmm. two-in-one trail, uh, Aosta H. You can't buy them. They've stopped selling them and selling them in the UK, but mm-hmm. they're amazing. They've got the built-in belt and pockets galore, and they don't chafe, and they're, they're absolutely brilliant for ultras. But I think there's one – it's for me, there's like one bit of kit that is an almost – it's like an essential that I have to have for any ultra. It doesn't really matter where else I wear. This will help. And it's it's called Two Tom Sport Shield, and it's basically – anti-chafe um balm mm-hmm. roll on and if you put that on in the right places it it kind of almost doesn't matter what you're wearing you can sort of fight off the chafe and that that was just an absolute godsend so you know again if you're going to places to multi-day ultras where it's you're in the desert or there's sand the stuff that sand and vaseline turns into uh, an absolute nightmare that will basically cut you to ribbons so you need something different and the two times i've been using it for a decade and it's it's absolutely brilliant no chafe no matter how long i run so that is my absolute go-to. That's one thing I won't compromise on. Nice. Eloquently explained as well, because I've been in a pub with you where you've explained that to me in uh, more detail than I wanted. <laughs> so um, <laughs> th- 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 yeah. thanks for, for the, um, <laughs> the nice <laughs> version the of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right then. And then I think finally, let's just uh, finish it up with, and this is probably going to be a difficult one for you both, but you've, you've given quite a lot of advice to people listening to this about doing ultras and maybe doing their first ultra but if there was one piece of advice above anything else that you could give to somebody who'd never done it before and wanted to to, to was heading out in about two months for their first ultra what would that be well i think i touched on on kind of the saying yes side of things like don't be afraid to do something that scares you obviously be sensible slightly sensible mm-hmm. with it but don't be afraid to do something that you. the other thing for me and um perhaps slightly cliche because of what i do but um is is try and get a friend to do it with you like the the process the training process is so much more enjoyable when you've got someone else to to suffer with slightly when when suffering occurs um but also the kind of celebration of the achievement i think is is so much nicer some of my best memories are you know again going back to emily but are finishing i did my first 100k with emily we obviously did our first have supported races with together in may we're going back to the uh the ultra running world together um which has taken me about three years to convince her to sign up again so very proud of myself to yeah. got her to do that um but it is the best feeling not only even if you don't run together you know seeing someone else who you know has gone through the same process worked as hard as you have, have put in the miles put in the time achieving something that perhaps they never thought they would is um is i think a, a very very nice very nice feeling so yeah try and uh, sign up a buddy too yeah i mean i i sort of echo what hannah said i think biggest thing is just believe in yourself you know don't you know give it a crack know that you're capable of more than you think but you'll never find out unless you actually go and give it a shot and the other thing I think that is a lot of people maybe miss the way that I now kind of frame these things because I've not finished a lot of races I've gone to ultras and and blown up and not gotten there but for me getting to the start line you should see that as success in its own right because you've signed up and you've given it a crack and you've had a go and you've been brave enough to say, I'm going to go and try and do that thing that terrifies me. And whether that's 50 Ks or whether that's, you know, seven days in the desert, you know, getting to the start line is a success in its own right. And everything beyond that is a bonus. So, you know, I, that's the way I kind of frame it. And I think that's a really sort of positive mindset to go into any ultra with. Nice. And my advice is if you're doing one of these races, like the threshold series, 
don't go mental with the free food because it is like literally being a kid in a sweet shop um <laughs> especially if you don't you don't eat that many sweets normally and i think at the end i i had a bag i, I, I was picking it up as i went along and i was filling my bag with it and <laughs> i got to the end kilos. and i had so much i just didn't want any of it it was yeah, completely unnecessary i think we were in the same tent weren't i and i just had sweets all over yeah. before the tent didn't want any of them i had so many credits i remember those extra as well yeah i remember finishing the race <laughs> with like just pockets of freddo's I hadn't seen Freddo's in so long, so every time I went to an A station, I just like shoved them in my pocket. It was also quite a warm day, so they weren't good at the end. Yeah, yeah. top advice, top advice. Well, that is making me want to do another one now, just to, to make that mistake again. There we go. Um, You've succeeded. Yeah, You've succeeded. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, but not in the way you wanted to. Um, okay, well, well, thanks, guys, and um, thanks, Hannah, for joining us uh, to talk through ultra running and, and give us your advice and uh, sorry i forgot to mention earlier that you're you're part of uh, twice the health as well if people want to find you on on instagram yeah um yes, where you I do am. much more than just ultras you do all sorts of fitness yeah well emily does emily uh, is much more versatile than i am <laughs> i just run a really long way very slowly um but yes thank you so much for having me it's been it's been lovely absolute pleasure and thank you kieran for um not getting too much detail about um chafing cream <laughs> There's other, there's time <laughs> okay guys catch you later thanks so much Cheers. that's it from us this month thanks a lot for listening or watching the podcast and don't forget to follow us on youtube or follow us on the various podcast providers of your choice to make sure that you are notified when we release the next one at the end of february thanks a lot for listening or watching and we'll catch you next time <laughs>